gentlemen, good morning to you. Uh, good morning for those of you who had a very long night like me, watching the TV, just trying to see what Britain was going to do. Well, I think I said yesterday it was going to be very close. What do I know? It actually wasn't that close at all. Um, so today I'm a little bleary-eyed because I did stay up all night and I couldn't resist watching it all unfold. But, uh, and we might even touch upon some of the implications uh, for Europe that have come out of this uh, rather extraordinary Cameron victory. We might talk about that over the next hour or so. Uh, I've got a fabulous guest and continuing the overarching theme of the symposium, looking at what it means to be small and yet powerful, impactful, maybe even beautiful. Um, we're going to do that in the context of geopolitics and security day today. Uh, as you can already see, my guest is a very familiar face to, I'm sure, all of you. He is the former Secretary General of NATO and indeed a former Prime Minister of Denmark, Anders Fogh Rasmussen. Hold your applause for just a second. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what we're going to talk about, and then I want you to give him a very warm hand. But it seems to me, having kicked off by telling you about the British election, the really important thing today, in a more historical perspective, is that it is the 70th anniversary of what we in Britain call VE Day, but I'm sure in different parts of Europe you've got different phrases, but it is in the end, the end of the Second World War in Europe, and we're commemorating it today right across the continent. And it seems to me that is a particularly apposite moment uh, to be thinking about the security of Europe, and indeed particularly the security of Europe's smaller states, and those states that are, if you like, on Europe's front line. Uh, as a result of events we've seen, not least in Ukraine in the recent past, I think it's a very important time to be considering that. So with that in mind, I think it is now time to give a very, very warm welcome to Anders Fogh Rasmussen. <laughs> and and as I, I want to start with the uh, development of that thought about where Europe is today in, in security terms. Y you recently left NATO, but of course, long experience there, and you've had to consider uh, Europe's security for, for many years. And I just wonder whether you agree with the sort of common wisdom, the prevalent analysis, that right now Europe faces its greatest security challenge since the Cold War, and some would say since VE Day, since the end of the Second World War. Is that the way you see it? Yes, that's exactly the way I, I see it. Um, we thought that after the end of the Cold War, uh, we had embarked on a new era of uh, peace and stability uh, in Europe, and actually we enjoyed uh, 25 years of uh, stability, peaceful cooperation, until the Russian attack on, on Ukraine. It was a wake-up call, a reminder that we can't take uh, security and stability in Europe for granted any longer. But can I start? The funny thing is, what you've just said is important, but it's not altogether true. Because, I mean, Putin has issued this challenge before. He issued it in the context of Georgia in 2007, 2008, with his actions in... South Ossetia, Abkhazia, he pushed the envelope there, and Europe at that point didn't seem interested in a, in a coherent, muscular response. Um, I, I think, seen retrospectively, we all hoped that it was, so to speak, an, an, an episode, an exception from the general rule that after the end of the Cold War, we had engaged in uh, a kind of partnership or at least cooperation uh, with uh, Russia. Uh, the Russian aggression uh, against Ukraine uh, demonstrated uh, that this, this goes uh, deeper. And of course, we have to adapt to that. Mm. So if, if I'm sitting in Riga or Tallinn uh, today, you know, the Baltic states or indeed Warsaw, should I be genuinely worried about my long-term security? Yes, but <clears throat> also confident that you are protected by the world's strongest military alliance, uh, NATO. As you all know, the core of NATO is Article 5, which states that we consider an attack on one an attack on all. So if Russia were to attack uh, one of the Baltic states, for instance, 
there is no doubt uh, that uh, NATO would respond determinedly. <laughs> well, <laughs> that, that is such an interesting phrase. I thought you were going to say there is no doubt Europe would respond militarily, but you didn't say that. You said determinedly. And me, to me, Article mm. 5 is very problematic because, <coughs> frankly, I can imagine scenarios where Russia, through all of its very clever use of asymmetric warfare techniques, special forces, cyber warfare, incursions and then withdrawals, could indeed launch some kind of attack on one of the Baltic states. And I bet you, not that I have the experience you do, that there would be a great deal of agonizing in NATO as to whether you would actually respond militarily. Yeah, I, I didn't use the word military because it's without any doubt it would be the military response, but... Is it without any doubt? It is without any so doubt. So we, we'd, but, go, but to, <coughs> we'd <coughs> go to war with Russia over a limited incursion into a tiny piece of Estonia. Yeah, but, but let me add, uh, this is... Ex we're, we're Estonians in the audience yeah, will get a chance to <laughs> discuss this. Yeah, but an attack is an attack. Um, yeah, but, uh, but we're but talking, about, but talking about nuclear, we're talking about Armageddon here, yep. and that's the thing. <coughs> I mean, you know, uh, is, is Article 5 really that black and white? Is it really? Article 5 is black and white, but let me add, um, we have seen what we call hybrid warfare. Uh, from the Russian side. Yeah. This, this mix of small green men and sophisticated propaganda and disinformation uh, campaign. Absolutely. With no and declaration of war. Yeah, yeah, I exactly. mean, it, it's not warfare as we know it. It's a no. new kind of, of a very sort of strategically nuanced threat, yeah. intimidation, which, which Putin has used in Ukraine, and he's seen it, frankly, he's seen it work. And he may be able to push into other areas. And, and you're telling me that NATO has a very coherent, worked-out response, are you? We do. And at the NATO summit in, in Wales in September last year, mm. we took a very important step in that direction, declaring for the first time that cybersecurity is now part of our collective security. In other words, a cyber attack against a NATO ally could um, invoke Article 5. That's the first time we have uh, taken that step, and it's remarkable because if you read the NATO treaty, it speaks about an armed attack against an ally. What is an armed attack in today's world? It may be more sophisticated. I, I, I mean, you're blowing my mind. I mean, I... I, I, <laughs> I, I you're, because we've, we've seen it. Uh, Russia did, uh, and they never admitted it, but I think nobody really doubts that R Russia was behind a cyber attack in Estonia some time ago. And, and you're saying that as a result of that, NATO decided that any future cyber attack, massive sort of systemic hack attack, uh, like you know the one we saw in Estonia, would prompt a, a military Article Five response. You're saying so. So the computers would go down, screens would go blank across uh, the infrastructure sites in arguably Estonia or Lithuania. And you're saying we'd send the bombers out, are you, toward no, Moscow? No, no I, I, we are never outspoken about how we will respond. We will respond, but it's part of Article 5 that um, uh, there is a kind of what I would call constructive ambiguity as to how we will respond. Mm. <laughs> well, <laughs> in... In the sense that you're being deeply ambiguous, it's working just fine. <laughs> but uh, I guess, I, as it happens, I live in London, not, not in Estonia, but I guess if I were in Estonia, I might want to know a little bit more uh, uh, about exactly how NATO proposes to develop this protection of its small frontline states on the, on the Eastern Front. I, I would genuinely would like to know more, so let's pretend I'm Estonian and you tell me a bit more. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, so it will remain between us, us uh, and the audience, us. Yeah. yes. <laughs> I can assure you that the Estonians know very well how we will respond. But I don't think, with all respect, this is the right place to right. reveal how okay. we will respond. I see. All right. Let, let's just think bigger about the way NATO works. Uh, you're Danish, and you were the SEC Gen, and you, know, you were the public figurehead, a very effective one, for NATO for, for years. But obviously, we all know, I mean, most of us in this room are Europeans, not all of us, but we all know that the real power in NATO resides in Washington. Agreed? 
of course, they, they are uh, the big shareholder. Um, but but they, own, all they own the joint. I mean, uh, no, no. Uh, formally speaking, <laughs> now let's start. Let's let's start with formalities. Um, all decisions in NATO are made by consensus. In other words, Luxembourg has exactly the same weight as the United States. That's the rule. Um, yeah. uh, that's it's, the uh, rule. It's, it's great on paper. In practice, it, it doesn't mean yeah, very of much. Of course, it, it makes a difference uh, that the United States pays 75% of the total bill for our common security. Obviously, it has an impact uh, on, the, on the whole alliance, but seen from a European perspective, we can be grateful for the strong American engagement in European security. I, says, I think now's the time to have it. <coughs> yeah, having established the nature of the threat that NATO f is perceived to be facing today, and, and having established that NATO's drawn up plans, as you say, some of them creatively ambiguous, but plans to respond to what is regarded as the real threat from Vladimir Putin, it's now time to consider just how NATO is functioning right now. And, th and the truth is, or maybe you would disagree with this, that, that America has become so much the, the burden bearer in NATO that it looks to many people as though the European members of the NATO alliance have, have become dependent upon Washington. Is that the way you see it? Yeah, but it's not breaking news. Uh, I mean, it's been that way ever since the end of uh, the Second World War. Um, but well, you, you, with, with respect, I mean, obviously, as, as it's the economic superpower, it, it, it has dominated the budget and the spending. But but European defence spending mm. has gone right down. Yeah, and so, so you point to a very important aspect uh, of a more fair burden sharing uh, within our alliance. Uh, obviously, it's not sustainable. Uh, that the United States uh, uh, pay uh, three quarters of the total bill. And whenever I visit the Hill uh, in, in Washington, s talk with lawmakers in Washington, they ask the question, why is it that we will have to pay the major part of, of that bill, taking into account that you have immediate security threats on your doorstep in Eastern Europe, in North uh, Africa, in the Middle East, you should pay a bit more. And that's exactly what we decided uh, at the NATO summit in, in Wales in, in September. All 28 allies signed up to a pledge to gradually increase defense investments within the next decade. Yeah, well, that's, they put it off, basically. I mean, because they've been promising to up their game for a long time. Even before you took over, they've been plom promising. I remember talking to your uh, predecessor, and, and they were promising him that they were going to increase the proportion of GDP spent on defense. And they just didn't deliver. And yeah. frankly, given the austerity and <laughs> debt discussions Europe is still wrestling with, it's hard to see they're going to deliver in, in the medium term either. Oh, we are in a new situation now because, as I said, uh, the Russian attack on Ukraine is a wake-up call that will um, initiate new thinking in many capitals. And actually, quite a number of allies have already made binding agreements in their parliaments to gradually move towards the... NATO 2% benchmark. The 2% benchmark how many, states... How many meet that benchmark today? Today, only four. Uh, but I would say... Um, one of them is the UK. One of them is the UK. Where, where the, the proportion is actually slipping, and some believe it's slipping under 2%. Yeah, so but uh, based on my talks with the Prime Minister and other members of the government, I am confident that the UK will stay above 2%. So there are four countries, US, UK, Greece, and Estonia. And in addition there to that... There is a that rich <laughs> irony that Greece, <laughs> Gre Greece is one of them. Yeah, exactly. And, and the other good old plucky Estonia. But, 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 you know, what I'm getting to, I use this word dependency. Mm -hmm. Is it not interesting that, that not even other Baltic states, you know, Lithuania and Latvia, or the Poles, or arguably some of the other countries on NATO's eastern frontier, are actually meeting the 2% target. So I come back to this idea about dependency. Even those who are most concerned mm. about the security threat to the East cannot find it within themselves to actually spend 2% of their national output 
on defence. Yeah, but they will, and that's uh, a very important point. And in addition to the four that already fulfil the 2% benchmark, I would say seven to eight have now made binding agreements in the Parliament to move towards the 2% benchmark quite fast, including Poland, by the way, uh, but also uh, Lithuania, Latvia, Romania, uh, just to mention some of them. Uh, so I think 2015 will represent the lowest point in European defence investments. From here, you will see a reverse trend. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll obviously get you back in 10 years and we'll look yeah, at this we'll see, amazing yeah. up surge in defence spending and we'll reflect together on how right you were. But uh, we, for the moment, I, you know, I'm just, it's not just about spending, it's also about a sort of psychology. Um, there's been a lot of talk about pre-positioning serious military hardware in the East to send a message to Putin, but also uh, developing a, a rapid action force that would either be stationed in the east or stationed somewhere that would make it extraordinarily quick to be able to move to whatever part of NATO's eastern front was at, uh, under threat. And, and we're talking thousands of troops. Where would those, you know, if we're talking about the small nations and, and uh, responsibility to protect, should those troops be drawn from those small nations themselves or should they be sent dispatched from American bases or you know, where do you think the responsibility lies? Um, uh, eventually, uh, it's a responsibility for the whole of the alliance, that is, all 28 uh, allies. In the very short run, uh, only a few, but fortunately, some of the bigger allies are able to deploy troops within 48, maximum 72 uh, hours, and they have already contributed. And uh, this spearhead force, this very rapid reaction force, has already conducted exercises. So it is up and running already. So they would, in the end, it would, uh, I'm just thinking the look of the thing. It, it still would be dominated by the US and the UK, will it? And, uh, in the short run, yes, because we need it now. Uh, but in a medium perspective, uh, all 28 allies will be able to contribute to this very rapid reaction force. And, and will they, <coughs> again, you know, Europe wrestles with, with these sorts of issues. We've wrestled with the idea of having US missile defense systems based on European soil. You know, again, some nations are quite enthusiastic, others don't like the idea. Uh, do you think that we are happy to have thousands of US forces essentially acting as Europe's protector on, on the Eastern Front for the time being? More than happy. Yeah. And uh, you have seen quite some European nations um, request uh, more uh, American troops uh, to participate uh, in this enhancement of our uh, territorial defense. And actually, the US was the very first ally to provide aircraft for reinforced air policing, uh, deploy land troops for military exercises in the Baltic states and Poland, and deploy military vessels to the Black Sea. So the US has been very committed to European security, but fortunately followed by all other 27 allies. Under your watch at NATO, uh, Ukraine was given a signal that it could one day uh, be considered for NATO membership, yes? Yes, we decided. Yeah, well, we decided that already in 2008, in Bucharest at the NATO but summit, that right. Ukraine will become a member of NATO, provided, of course, they fulfil the necessary criteria. That was a terrible mistake, wasn't it? No, it was upon request uh, from the Ukrainian well, yeah, side. No, nobody does everything that's requested of them. I mean, you you think yeah. about what is yeah. in the interest of your of your institution, and do you think it was in the interest? Long you know, now that we know what's happened. Was it in the interests of NATO to give a strong signal to Ukraine that it could expect to uh, you know, follow this path through to membership, full this membership of NATO? This decision was based on a very fundamental principle, uh, which was included in an OECE uh, charter for uh, European security already in 1999. All countries in OECE, including Russia, subscribed to the principle that I each and every nation has an inherent right to decide its alliance affiliation herself. So in other words, uh, when Georgia or Ukraine or any other country 
uh, sense an application for membership or indicates an interest in becoming a future member of our organization, of course, uh, we will have to deal with that the normal way. It's not for Russia to decide. No, but off the record, I've spoken to very senior members of governments across Europe who say, you know, frankly, there is no way Europe, uh, Ukraine is ever going to be a full member of NATO. It's clear that uh, Ukraine does not fulfill the necessary criteria uh, right now, but we have engaged in a constructive partnership with Ukraine and we help Ukraine to move forward with the necessary reforms. But you see, what I'm saying is maybe in retrospect, it was a mistake to go down this path in the first place. You know what the, Russia, the Russians say, uh, th there's a fundamental problem here because uh, post-1989, you know, when the Berlin Wall came down and then German, uh, Germany unified, there was a tacit understanding between the Russians, the Americans, the Germans, involving Helmut Kohl and <coughs> the, the leaderships in Washington and, and Moscow, that, that NATO would not relentlessly uh, move into that space, which used to be Soviet, but which was now liberated, uh, free space. And, and that, bro that agreement, that tacit agreement, was broken. No, uh, but it's a Russian myth, and uh, it's good that you give me an opportunity to comment on that, because such a promise has never, ever been given. I, I, uh, I spoke to Gorbachev in Berlin around the anniversary of the wall coming down, and he said quite specifically, nothing was written on paper, but it was a signal sent from the West to Moscow that this was the deal. Russia would allow, or, you know, would stand back and do nothing to stop German unification, but in return, the understanding was NATO would not fill that space, the eastern space, with this military alliance. Yeah, but it's not true, and fortunately, documents from those negotiations have now been uh, declassified and made public so we can see actually what was said and what wasn't said. It was even not discussed for the very good reason that at that time uh, uh, the Warsaw Pact uh, still existed. The Warsaw Pact was not dissolved until the year after in 1991. So during the negotiations on German reunification this issue was even not discussed. Uh, so for that very reason, uh, no promise was given uh, to, to, to the Russians. Let me add to this. Mm. When we decided to enlarge uh, NATO, we did a lot to reach out to Russia and make it an inclusive process so uh, Russia could be part of this whole uh, process. The first enlargement of NATO took place in 1999. Two years before that, we adopted a joint Russian-NATO document called the NATO-Russia Founding Act. Among the more <coughs> visible initiatives were, um, uh, was uh, that <coughs> Russia was allowed to establish a permanent representation, that's a kind of embassy, in the middle of NATO headquarters in Brussels. They got access, they got access to NATO in 1997. Uh, are they, are they still enjoying Next, that today? Yes, yeah? it's still there. Yeah. So uh, they're watching, they're, they're, they're allowed to witness all this ambiguous preparation you're making. Uh, well... I mean, uh, so, we, so we, we, why we, is the point? You might as well tell us, because the Russians know they're watching it all happen in Brussels. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure they know a lot, but <laughs> uh, we have measures to make sure that uh, there is <laughs> certain confidentiality. Now, let me add to this. In 2004, the next big enlargement of uh, NATO took place. Again, two years before that, <coughs> in 2002, uh, we established something very particular, namely a NATO-Russia Council. Russia is the only country outside NATO with whom we have such a council. No, As I, I a forum for consultations, yeah. discussions, decisions, on collaborative projects. But the more projects. you explain to me just how cozy and friendly all of this yeah. uh, structure is, the more I'm thinking, <laughs> Christ, we, we just got it so wrong. We, we misunderstood uh, the Russian stroke Putin agenda completely. And you were part of that, unfortunately. I mean, I, it's easy. I've got hindsight. You didn't know at the time, but you got it all wrong. No. You thought he was a partner, and it turns out he's an enemy that you've just described as the greatest threat to Europe since the Second World War. Yeah, but still, I think we did the right thing. I would argue... Well, we obviously didn't. I mean, uh, we did the wrong uh, thing. Uh, yeah, but, but I would argue the following way. After the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union and uh, breakdown of the wall in Europe, 
I think we had what I would call a generational obligation to try to try and establish a partnership and stronger cooperation between the West and uh, Russia. We did, but you're right, uh, we didn't succeed. But I think we still, I think try. we had to try. No, I, I guess that, that I understand that, fair enough. Uh, just switching to Washington again just for a moment. Um, <coughs> you were still sec gen, weren't you? When, do you remember Robert Gates made that extraordinary valedictory speech at uh, NATO headquarters? You, you, <coughs> were, you were there, weren't you? <coughs> yes. And, and he basically <coughs> said, look, guys, <coughs> we're getting fed up with this. I mean, you have to understand, I think Libya had been happening the, the year before, and he said, you know, we, we specifically tried <coughs> to hold back on that one, and you guys said you'd take the lead, and then it turned out mm. when you took the lead, you didn't have the equipment, you didn't even have the ammunition. We had to provide you with bullets, or else you'd have run out of bullets. He said it's not good enough. And he said, I've got people in my Congress <coughs> telling me that <coughs> the United States is wasting its time in NATO, and that there is no future for us propping up uh, a continent in this way, when our pivot to Asia tells us that actually there are much bigger fish to fry in security terms than, mm. than Europe. How worried are you today about America's long-term commitment to Europe and to NATO? Well, I think uh, the United States will stay committed to Europe, but I also uh, emphasize the need for more European, not only uh, economic investment, but also political investment in the transatlantic uh, alliance. But, but because basically, Secretary Gates uh, was right, uh, that Libya was in a way a positive story of uh, European uh, willingness to take leadership of a joint operation. But we also learned that the Europeans couldn't do that yeah. without uh, significant American contributions. So the lesson learned is that the, European must, the Europeans must invest more in critical capabilities such as intelligence, drones, air-to-air -air refueling, transport capacity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and, and, and that's actually going to happen now. Do you think, and this is a broad question, do you think that we in Europe, and I know not everybody here is European, but many of us are, we in Europe are, are, are too pacifist, you know, we're, we're too keen on talking and negotiating and dialoguing, and we are just not ready to consider uh, more assertive, more military-based approaches. To a certain degree, I think that picture is uh, an accurate depiction of uh, the, uh, the European uh, attitude, and personally, I'm in favor of a more uh, robust uh, approach. I very much ag agree with um, uh, the former um, American president um, uh, who said that in order to ensure peace and stability in the world, speak softly but carry a big stick. I think that's necessary. Do you think Angela Merkel has a big stick? Uh, I do, but she's... No, no tittering at the back. <laughs> We're, we're talking geopolitics here. We're, we're yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think she has, but for historical reasons, she is also reluctant to use it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I mean, this is I mean, arguably it's funny, but it's actually important. You know, we're, talk we're talking about Europe's dominant power. Thanks to the economics of Europe right now, there is no question that, that Germany is Europe's leader. And, and if you're telling me that that, that there is still a, a problem here, that, that Germany hasn't come to terms with security realities and how to wield, best wield Europe's collective interest in the world with some muscularity, then Europe has a problem. Um, we need a very strong uh, German uh, engagement and we have seen an, an increased uh, German engagement also militarily uh, during Have recent we? years. Yes, for instance, in Afghanistan. The trainers. Yeah, uh, trainers. No, 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 no. Uh, the, the Germans uh, provided uh, quite a number of troops uh, to uh, the ISAF operation in Afghanistan. For many years, uh, they took leadership of our operation uh, in Kosovo, the K4 operation, and recently, 
uh, German, uh, Germany decided uh, to contribute significantly to this spearhead force uh, to be deployed, uh, if necessary, in the East. Mm. Let me, uh, and I want to bring people in very soon, but let me just tap into your experience, not just as sec gen of NATO, but also as prime minister of a, of a, a very successful but smaller EU member state nation. When you look at the two institutions, the security institution, NATO, and then the sort of political economic institution, the EU, which do you see as, um, le if I can put it this way, less dysfunctional? <laughs> <laughs> but NATO is not dysfunctional. NATO oh, yeah, is it is. very we, We've efficient. just been discussing NATO's <laughs> dysfunctionality. It, it has one dominant player that, that props it up, and, and many of the others refuse to bear the burden. So that's pretty dysfunctional. No, it functions. I mean, it well, takes decisions. It, um, it may take some time because we have to achieve consensus among 28, but when a decision is made, we really move in a powerful way. We have seen that on several occasions. So your answer is, if you refuse to accept that NATO is in any way dysfunctional, what about the EU? I, I would like to see uh, a more outward-looking uh, European Union with a stronger global uh, perspective. I understand very well that the Euro crisis uh, in many ways have uh, focused attention on some internal uh, challenges within the European Union, but the world needs uh, a stronger European voice in collaboration with the United States. Mm. It's just both, it, both NATO and the, and the EU are very complex, you know, because there are so, I mean, I, I, frankly, I've even forgotten how many member states there are in there. There's 28 members of the EU, unless it's changed in the last no, but day or two. Now we have 28 in both organizations. Oh, okay, that's easy then, okay. So yeah. we've got 20, <laughs> 28 member states in both, and so many decisions uh, within both have to be based on unanimity. So uh, that makes for a very complicated political game to get stuff done in, inside both institutions. Do you think that, uh, and this is where we get back to the considering the power and the impact of small nations, do you think there's gonna be have to be a, a, a concerted move away from the unanimity concept towards much, much more reliance on um, majority decision-making in both? No, basically, no. I, I think in NATO, uh, we will maintain a system of uh, consensus decision-making. In the EU, is already a mix. You have certain decisions to be made based on consensus, other decisions uh, by majority or qualified majority uh, voting. I think that will remain the basics of the decision-making uh, processes, and they also strike a good balance. Um, um, and now, instead of focusing on details and decision-making processes, let us take an overall look at this. And on this very day, the 8th of uh, May, mm. uh, the 70th anniversary of uh, the end of, of the Second World War, NATO and the European Union in combination have uh, ensured the uh, or, uh, and, and guarantee the longest period of uh, peace in European history. That's why I have said in a bit of a provocative way that NATO is the world's most successful peace movement you have ever seen. And in collaboration with the European Union, it has created the framework uh, for progress, prosperity and more freedom uh, in, in Europe. That is the overall perspective. But you, <laughs> you, um, you were the prime minister of a, as I say, small, successful country that, rather like my medium-sized and very complicated country, decided that, that the direction of travel in the European Union toward ever greater integration and symbolized, you know, with the creation of the common currency, uh, was not something that you wanted to be part of, just like we didn't want to be part of. But is it your analysis that whatever the current problems of the Eurozone, there is still a direction of travel inside Europe, inside the European Union, um, to ever closer union, both economic, fiscal, and ultimately political integration? Um, <coughs> 
I would nuance it uh, a bit. I would say, when it comes to um, the very heavy overall uh, political issues with maybe geopolitical uh, implications, we need a stronger cooperation uh, among uh, European states. When it comes to a lot but cooperation of... Cooperation uh, is different from integration. Cooperation you can achieve through member states working together as separate entities. Integration is when you pool more and more of your uh, formerly sovereign powers into a collective multilateral... Yeah, but when it comes to uh, trade, uh, or sort of the internal market, uh, foreign policy, monetary policy, the common currency, etc., I think we need uh, also more uh, integration and to speak with one voice. But when it comes to a lot of uh, details in people's daily life, I think uh, Brussels should recede uh, and leave more room uh, for local decisions. But, you know, the, the, the consensus is building that the Eurozone is going to have to change, but the, that those who truly believe in a common currency and want to commit to it forever and make it work forever will have to, in the end, do radical things. They'll have to pool more fiscal and political powers. They'll have to create a, a European treasury, arguably with a, a European treasury secretary. The, you know, these are radical but, but necessary steps in the view of many people to make sense of the common currency. Yeah, it's not my view. I, I mean, I, 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 it's my position that it is possible to combine a common currency with uh, certain uh, local national decisions uh, on uh, economic policies. If you are willing to take the consequences, if you pursue irresponsible policies. What, you mean get chucked out like the Greeks might be? Well, it's not for me to decide, but of course... Um, Will Greece uh, it go? Will it, is will Greece it will set an example uh, if uh, members of uh, the Eurozone that pursue irresponsible policies also feel the consequences. Mm. You're, you're positively Merkel-esque in that, but I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit ambiguous. You're, you're unlike a Angela Merkel, you're free to s totally tell us what you think because you're not actually in power and you're not accountable anymore to voters. So yep. let's just very quickly, before we get to the audience's sensible questions, uh, a couple, yes or no questions. Uh, in a year's time, will Greece still be inside the Eurozone? Yes, I think so. Yes. Uh, in five years' time, will Denmark be in the Euro? Uh, five years and maybe a narrow uh, time horizon, but I do believe that Denmark one day will join uh, the Euro. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. Have you told Danes that? And <laughs> yeah, I told the Danes that <laughs> I'm in favor of the Euro. But they voted against yeah, you. Yeah, they voted against. I regret that. <laughs> <laughs> Those silly Danes. <laughs> <laughs> and a final yes, no, quick fire question. In three years' time, will the UK still be a member of the European Union? Yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, good. Well, we'll and we need that. We'll get on the phone to David Cameron and tell him. Uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, right, let's have some questions. So um, we'll start at the front and move back. No, we won't. Let's start at the back and move forwards because people at the back don't get a fair shake. There's, th there's three people with their hands up on the back, toward the back. Yeah, let's start with the lady in the middle. Tell us who you are and... Hello, my Hello. name is Sol Vega. I'm from Lithuania. And ah. I was wondering <laughs> that... Um, Basically, quite recently, we've taken measures to make ourselves safer from Russia, for example, setting up new energy supplies from Norway instead. And, um, um, sorry, uh, so because the level of security that NATO is set to provide us is quite ambiguous, what other measures can we take uh, and other small nations such as Lithuania to protect ourselves against Russia? Um, aside from, of course, um, uh, you know, reinstating uh, army conscript, which is kind of ridiculous because we're tiny. Mm. Okay. Um. Yeah, but um, the Lithuanian example uh, is an excellent example to illustrate that for small countries, it makes sense to join a bigger alliance to be protected. 
Uh, and that's actually the ultimate guarantee for, for, for Lithuania, that if Lithuania were to be attacked, there is no doubt, no doubt whatsoever, uh, that uh, NATO uh, would respond militarily. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> just to avoid any misunderstanding. <laughs> Uh, in addition to that, this goes two ways. It's a two-way street. In exchange, Lithuania should also live up to the 2% benchmark. And I say this because Lithuania had actually cut drastically the defense budget. But Lithuania is now also among the allies uh, that have pledged and in parliament reached a broad agreement to gradually move towards the 2% benchmark. Finally, it's important as the Lithuanians are doing now, to reduce the dependency on imported energy from uh, Russia. Uh, building this uh, uh, liquid natural uh, gas uh, uh, terminal and building a fixed link for electricity across the Baltic Sea. See, that message is important, but it's interesting that at the very same time, the Germans, for example, are cooperating with the Russians in building huge new gas pipelines into Europe. So. Uh, would you say that's a mistake? No, it's not a mistake, but it should be supplemented uh, by a better functioning internal um, uh, European energy market. Now the European Union has decided to create what is called an energy union. A very important part of that would, uh, should be a free flow of energy across borders so that the Russians can't blackmail one single country uh, uh, because then uh, that country can't get energy from other uh, members of the European Union. Right. Uh, I, I just want to stick at the back, and then I'm going to come forward, don't worry. But there were uh, two other, let's take two at once. The two other hands that were near the lady who had the question just now, the, there's two hands up, so let's take two at once. So you start, and then go over there. Thank you. Uh, I am David Simba from Uganda. Uh, I want to extend the conversation across the Mediterranean, uh, arguably because it is Europe backyard. Mm -hmm. Uh, yesterday in work session, uh, uh, Honorable Tete from Ghana convincingly present to us the fact that NATO missing Libya um, has come to a huge cost. And the indifference we are seeing today of what is going on in Libya today vis-a-vis -vis the military intervention there um, in the Gaddafi regime's uh, overthrow has been, um, has been the cause of many, many nightmares there. What is NATO trying to do in terms of owning responsibility for a messy Libya today. Right. A huge political consequence, both across the Sahara, north and south. Right, good question, yeah. <laughs> don't, don't answer it just yet, Anders, we'll get the, there, there's <laughs> okay. another person, no, uh, but the, the other person with a hand up at the back, yeah. Hi, uh, Dan from the Philippines. So uh, just a very practical question. Let's say, hypothetically, uh, next month, uh, Russian troops with unmarked vehicles crossed eastern Ukraine and did all sorts of stuff. So what should be NATO's response? That's the first question. The second is what would be the realistic response given the realities of modern day uh, of the current situation? Yeah, all right. Well, we sort of covered that, but we can do it again because it's good fun. And. Uh uh, so I'm never averse to poking Anders with a stick, so let's do that again. But, <laughs> but let's start with the good question about Libya. What, what, I mean, in essence, what is NATO doing today to, to take responsibility for, to do something about the mess that it, in, you know, arguably in large part, left behind after the NATO intervention in Libya? Yeah. First of all, let me stress that the NATO military operation in Libya, a seven-month operation, uh, from March till October 2011 was a success. We fulfilled uh, the United Nations mandate to protect the civilian population in uh, Libya against attack uh, from its own uh, government. According to the mandate, we had to leave uh, once the mission uh, was uh, completed, and we did so. Uh, by the end of October 2011. But, but so respect, that part of it was a success. Well, yeah, but the mandate, you, the interpretation of the mandate, and this is what people in, for example, Russia say, the interpretation of the mandate was pushed to the very edge of reasonableness because you, not just humanitarian protection, but also, frankly, it became clear that NATO's agenda was to finish off the Gaddafi regime. No, no, we, we couldn't do that. I mean, you, you can't remove a dictator from the air. We, we were allowed to do air operations alone uh, only. 
uh, and we didn't have troops on the ground. Uh, freedom fighters in Libya uh, took care of uh, Gaddafi. Now, our part of it was a success, but I also have to add that the international community failed in following up to that successful military operation. And this is the reason why today Libya is pretty close to becoming a failed state. NATO did something actually because we got a request uh, from the then Libyan authorities to help them build their security sector. We responded positively. But because of the security situation uh, in, in, in the country, it has not been possible for NATO to, 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 to actually help. But we were ready to do that. And, and, and NATO and the EU do have to do much more, do they not, right now Absolutely. in Libya to stem the flow of these poor, poor people, many of whom are dying in the Mediterranean Sea, trying to get to Europe to escape uh, horrible circumstances in their home countries. But, but it's no good just beefing up the sort of naval operations in the Mediterranean. You, we, we have to do something in Libya. I think so. And seen retrospectively, the United Nations should have deployed a peacekeeping mission to Libya once the NATO operation was completed. Did you say that at the time? We did. Mm. But, you know, I mean, within the UN, it's uh, very difficult. Oh, to let's achieve. not even go. When we're talking dysfunctional yeah. institutions, <laughs> let's, let's not even begin. But, um, okay, the second question, quick, we have sort of talked about it, but, but a very specific question. When those Russian so called green men traverse Ukraine from their hideouts in eastern Ukraine and start doing naughty stuff in, let's say, for argument's sake, Moldova you know, Transnistria, which is a, a, a potential flashpoint. Uh, realistically, what is NATO actually going to do? But let me make clear, no one uh, within NATO uh, has uh, any intention to engage in an open war uh, with uh, Russia. And there is a clear difference between be being a member of NATO and not being a member of NATO. If you are a member of NATO, you're covered by our Article 5, an attack would uh, initiate a counterattack and defense of that ally. But if you're not a member of NATO, uh, you're not covered by uh, Article 5. That is the clear difference. And that's the reason <laughs> why the West uh, has uh, imposed economic sanctions uh, on Russia instead. Yes. And if Russia were to go further, uh, I think the international community should, but also would, impose even tougher sanctions But uh, what you're Russia. saying is interesting, uh, this absolute distinction between NATO non-member. Even if Russian forces, uh, tanks rolled into Kiev and tanks rolled into Chisinau in Moldova and tanks rolled into Tbilisi, uh, you're saying we just ratchet and ratchet and ratchet up the sanctions, but there would be no way there'd be any sort of military threat, military engagement with Moscow. Well, I think some allies, but not, I, I'm not speaking about NATO, but some allies would then consider providing uh, defensive weapons uh, for the Ukrainians, for instance, to make them uh, uh, more capable to defend themselves. I say individual allies because NATO as an alliance does not possess weapons, so it's for individual allies to take that decision. And if the Russians were uh, to step up uh, their military engagement in Ukraine or elsewhere, I wouldn't exclude that some allies would provide uh, defensive weapons for the Ukrainians and, and others. And would you personally support that? Would Absol you be in favor of that? Uh, absolutely, I would. You would. Um, uh, but it's a national decision. Mm. Okay. Uh, right, let's move uh, toward the middle, then we'll get to the front. Um, there's uh, sort of sorry, two hands uh, up. I, sorry, I oh, already Oh, you've already got the mic. Uh, you've, you've usurped my authority. That's <laughs> very wise. Yeah, go on. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Bria, and I'm from China. So uh, just a few minutes back, you mentioned uh, the defense uh, budget. So I'm sure that you are aware that uh, defense budget is actually like uh, the largest budget in like a whole lot of countries, such as uh, like China, US, and uh, so, uh, many others. So while I uh, according to your presentation, it seems that uh, it's absolutely necessary either as a like, counterbalance to other powers or as a preparation. But there are other opinions saying that uh, the defense budget in a lot of countries is eating up, say, budgets that could have been used uh, to for 
social um, purposes uh, and uh, like climate change reactions, etc. So I'm just curious about uh, your reactions on that. Thanks. Yeah, but I, I share the view that um, uh, defense investment or even increased defense investments can never be an end in itself. Ob obviously not. Uh, there would be better purposes uh, uh, of, of investment, um, but um, uh, security is a prerequisite for freedom, it's a prerequisite for progress and prosperity. So while defense comes at a cost, insecurity is much more uh, expensive. Uh, and this is the reason why taking the new, the dramatically changed security situation in Europe uh, into account, I think the Europeans must invest more uh, in, in defense and, and security as a defensive measure. As a matter of interest, just because I'm interested, what was the percentage of defense spending in Denmark when you were PM? Yeah, yeah that's a very good question because it was only 1.4%. Oh. So but so yeah. it's, it's kind of easier when you're sec gen of NATO to make this clarion call <laughs> than it is when yeah. you're actually running a country answerable to electors who want lots of the programs that this lady is talking about. You yeah. know, it, 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 it's a real problem, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And it's not only easier, but it's also the duty uh, of the Secretary General of NATO to make the case that we need more uh, investment in defense. Now, um, <clears throat> let me add, this is, of course, not only a question of how much you spend on defense, but also how money sure. is spent. And for my country, <clears throat> I can say safely that Denmark is at the very forefront whenever uh, NATO calls on uh, contributions uh, from uh, individual uh, member states. No, I've met Danish troops around the world on NATO missions, so I know that, that you are committed. Uh, right, let's go to this lady here on the side, and then we'll go to a hand in the middle there. Okay, hello. Uh, Over in the middle, but yeah, go, you go ahead. I represent Estonia, and I work for International Center for Defense and Security. So it's kind of relevant, and we are proudly small, and we uh, you know, 2% two, two of the budget of defense, yeah. we deliver it. But let's admit that actually we enter in more uh, conflict and war of narratives, and uh, as we saw how the hybrid warfare was conducted. And at this point, um, in Estonia, the already uh, rotation basis or on NATO forces is good. How, for how long do you believe the strength of coherence would hold on in NATO? As we already enter in a uh, war of narrative, so we would see from Russia more ambiguous and uh, showing off acts as how it uh, crosses the airspace, how its submarines are uh, popping up across the shores of Sweden. And the second question, how to force Finland and Sweden actually to reconsider their own defense because they're close to us. And Finland locks itself till 2020 in gas contracts with Gazprom. It's really difficult to negotiate energy security issues with them. Thank you. Okay. On the first part of your question, I'm afraid that this conflict scenario will last for a very long time, maybe even for decades, very similar to the Cold War. You think it'll out outlive Putin's hold on the Kremlin? I mean, you think this, this is yeah. uh, longer term than just Putin's mentality? Exactly, because it's Im an important point to understand that this is not just about the person, Putin. It goes deeper, much deeper in the Russian uh, society. Uh, that's a story in itself. But my conclusion is that it will last maybe, unfortunately, for decades. And for as long, you will see uh, unity and cohesion uh, within NATO. Actually, paradoxically, uh, Putin has done a lot to strengthen our alliance uh, because no one is any longer in doubt uh, of the raison d'etre, the purpose, the core task uh, of NATO uh, it is to defend uh, our, our allies. Sweden now, and Finland. Sweden and Finland. Um, well, I'm not going to interfere with the domestic debate, but I'm following it with interest. And in both countries, you have seen recently uh, an increased 
support for a future uh, NATO uh, membership. But I don't think it will happen uh, in the very near uh, future. And it's for them to decide. But I can say that both Sweden and Finland are some of, of the very closest partners uh, of uh, NATO. And if they were to apply for membership, they could join overnight. You surprised me. I thought Danes loved scoring points off the Swedes. I thought you might take this opportunity to say some nasty things, but you don't. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, let's go to two hands sort of in the middle of that. Has somebody got the microphone already? No? Uh, well, in that case, let's go to a hand on the side here. You, sir. Yeah. And then let's, there's a gentleman with a red tie who's in the middle. So let's go to him next. Oh. But you first. Thank you. My name is George Bla. I'm coming from Germany but I have born in Czech Republic, okay? Well, Mr. Saka, I will just finger point at the historical points, okay? You are speaking about the speech of Gorbachev and the promising, promising for not increase the, the border for NATO in the East, but how you can, uh, in the person of Kohl and your guys and Gorbachev decide about Sir's country, independent country, and the NATO is an open alliance. Everybody can enter if fulfill all the requests. Well, this cannot be that the answer from the BBC and CNN to Gorbachev is just attack back the West country and not attack the Gorbachev. How you can decide or how you can will the promising about the third country? That's my point. Uh, well, um, <laughs> I'm not supposed to be the one answering the questions, but... Uh, <laughs> it was not a question, it was a note, because uh, it's every time is the same direction. I mean, all I would say is, when I was talking to Gorbachev recently, I mean, I, I wasn't agreeing or disagreeing with him. I was just conveying what, what Gorbachev, who, you know, some in the West see as something of a hero for what he did in, in the okay, period from 89 to the early 90s, what he, he was expressing a widely held Russian view. That's all I was trying to convey. Um, and, and you can, uh, as Anders has done, he says it's just not true. And, and he's given us his inside take on what the negotiations were like in the early 1990s. But all I was saying was many Russians feel that there was a betrayal there, that, that, that tacit promises made were then uh, betrayed. It's just the way it is. I mean, it's useful to know how Moscow's thinking, isn't it? Even if you don't agree with it. No, it's not only the Moscow, how it's thinking. It's just to uh, find some defense why the Putin attacked the Ukraine? You know, that's in, in my opinion is in the Germany, in the, in the newspaper, and the television is the same way to 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 find understanding for the aggressor like Russia. Well, I agree. I think the key is to understand. And I mean, what what uh, Anders was saying was very interesting. That you know, you wanted to see Russia post ninety one as, as a potential partner, yeah. and you gave it your best shot. But you've now reached an understanding that, that that didn't work and that you cannot today, bearing in mind NATO security needs, see Russia as a partner. You have to see it as a potential enemy. Yeah, yeah exactly. But I'm very pleased to see you in this situation. <laughs> you have to <laughs> defend uh, yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I... I I prefer asking the <laughs> questions, frankly, not uh, answering them. And I'm sure everybody else does too. I promised the gentleman with the red suit who's got a very straight arm up, but now he's put it down. But put your arm up again, sir. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> no, yeah, can we get the microphone to, to the gentleman there? No, no, well, no, I didn't mean you, to be honest. Uh, uh, <laughs> there's two guys with red ties near each other. Uh, sorry, it's just bad luck, but we'll get to you later. Uh, Alexander from Montenegro. Um, Montenegro is an aspiring uh, country that aspires to become a NATO member. Right. There is a big debate going on back home, like should we, shouldn't we? How does uh, there is a very strong media influence that we should be? And keep, keep the mic near your mouth. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's like we are not the, the only country in the region that is going through the same process. Serbia is going through. Yeah. Bosnia as well. Uh, all three countries are very like economically weak now after the crisis. Uh, there is a high unemployment, especially youth unemployment. Uh, possibilities for instabilities are like endless. Um, and in a sense, um, even Putin, uh, well, Russia is very heavily invested in all these three countries because of the orthodox ma majorities, right? Um, and even Putin referred to the region as a kind of playful playground for, for any kind of other stuff. Like it's, it's, uh, he finds it amusing to, be, to play with the region. 
Uh, is it uh, pushing for um, NATO kind of like integration of this part of the region, which is very essential, we all agree, uh, at this point where uh, we are still not in the EU, creating a potential danger for the region and create additional instability? Uh, should we wait until we actually integrate into the common market before we decide to join the monetary union? Right. Anders? Well, um, <clears throat> first of all, let me stress, this will remain national decisions whether a country will apply for membership of either uh, NATO or the EU or both. Um, and then uh, is, of course, a decision within the EU and NATO whether to accept uh, new uh, uh, members. Having said that, it's my vision to see all, all, I stress, all countries in the Balkans integrated in what we call the Euro-Atlantic structures, that is, uh, the European Union uh, and, and NATO. Um, uh, right now, it seems uh, that Montenegro, uh, when we're speaking about NATO at least, uh, is the closest. They haven't, uh, Montenegro hasn't got uh, any guarantees, uh, but uh, uh, last year, uh, it was decided uh, that an assessment will take place this year and foreign ministers will take a decision by the end uh, of uh, 2015 whether time is ripe to extend an invitation uh, to uh, uh, Montenegro. As far as uh, Macedonia is concerned, uh, I would say there is one overshadowing, outstanding issue, and that is the question of the name, the, the official name uh, of uh, Macedonia. Um, um, now I am free to call the country Macedonia, mm. but as Secretary General of NATO, I have to say the former Yugoslav Republic of, uh, and so on. Uh, but um, now I can call it Macedonia, but still there is an unsolved dispute uh, on, on, on the name issue, and until that is solved, uh, it's hard to see uh, uh, real uh, uh, progress. As far as Bosnia has a governor is concerned, um, uh, they need to carry out uh, quite a number of uh, reforms uh, before that country is mature uh, for moving forward vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, NATO. As finally on Serbia, I would very much like to see strengthened relations uh, between Serbia uh, and, and NATO. For historical reasons, there is quite some skepticism in Serbia as regards uh, NATO, but um, in my recent meetings with the Serb president, he acknowledged that NATO of today stands as a guarantor of peace and stability uh, in uh, the Balkans, including the protection of the rights of Serbs uh, in uh, Kosovo. So we are moving forward, and I hope one day to see all countries in the region as members of both NATO and the European Union. Okay, we've got time for a couple more uh, questions before lunch break, but you know what, I've just, decided, I've just remembered, I completely forgot, we, you know, we love voting here at St. Gallen, and as it's UK election day, we should surely vote as much as possible. Uh, can we bring the, ah, here we go. Uh, live voting question. Do you expect NATO to retaliate if one of its members gets attacked? Well, goodness knows, we've chewed this over for the last hour. So let's see what you think, having heard about all of the ambiguities and commitments and everything else. So those of you who are voting on your phones, get voting. Um, anyway, we'll leave that sitting there for now. Oh, good, there's the instructions. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to read them out, that's pointless, but if you follow the instructions, you can have a vote, and we'd love you to vote, because actually, given what Anders has said, I'd be very intrigued to know what your feeling is. So get voting, and by the end of the uh, debate, in a few minutes' time, we'll have a vote count for you. Okay, let's come to the front and do a few at the front. We'll go to you, ma'am, and then uh, you, sir, holding your phone. But we need to get microphones to you. <coughs> now, the, the lady at the front in the green shirt first. Um, hi, I'm Zoe, I'm from the United States. Um, I'm quite interested in the sort of bold assertion that she made about NATO being the most successful peace movement, especially given former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's comments about Gaddafi, um, where she basically said, you know, we came, we saw, and he died. And then also the nature of the NATO coalition campaign in Afghanistan. Um, you know, 
as an American, I personally see NATO sort of as the means by which the United States legitimates neoconservative hypermilitary politics and policies and aspirations abroad, which do come frequently at the expense of peace of others. So how, and also I find it interesting that the only time that Article 5 has ever been invoked is in response to September 11. Um, so how do you define peace and how are you defining security? Because it certainly does not seem that it's global. <laughs> Well, uh, of course, this is a domestic uh, U.S. debate, basically, but that may point to the fact uh, that U.S. military engagement abroad is actually a bipartisan uh, issue uh, in, in, in the U.S. Let me remind you uh, that then-President Clinton uh, was the one who took decisions to engage heavily uh, in the Balkans and eventually succeeded uh, in uh, establishing peace and afterwards keeping peace and stability uh, in, in the Balkans. So it's both democratic presidents and republican presidents. And seen from my perspective, and I am also speaking as a former prime minister of a small uh, European country, I appreciate such American leadership because we know from experience that it is not until American engagement that anything uh, happens. We saw that during <clears throat> the Second World War. We saw that during the Cold War. We saw that in the aftermath of the Cold War in the, Balkan, in the Balkans, uh, for instance. <clears throat> so it's just fair uh, that NATO invoked Article 5 in defense of the United States after the 9-11 um, uh, attack. I will not suggest that all military operations uh, have uh, been uh, successful, uh, but uh, I still think they have been uh, justified because if you want peace, if you want peace in the world, sometimes, unfortunately, you have to be prepared for war because otherwise terrorists and tyrants will rule our world. But, but the, the point is interesting, you know, what, what there may have been a humanitarian case for intervening in Libya to uh, protect the people of Benghazi and other cities at that time, although it, some then believe it became much more a mission to topple <laughs> Gaddafi. But what business was it of NATO, you know, which is all a, 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 an institution built to protect the, the security of the North Atlantic of, of Europe? You know, member states of NATO could have engaged in that collectively if they wanted to, but, but to put a NATO umbrella over it, what's it got to do with NATO? That's exactly the discussion we had when we took the decision, and the argument is the following. When the United Nations Security Council sure. adopts such a resolution, all member states uh, of the United Nations um, have a responsibility to actually implement uh, that resolution, and NATO allies, and they are all members of the United Nations, decided that the best way to implement um, uh, this Security Council resolution would be to let NATO take responsibility for the operation. Actually, it started as what we call a coalition of the willing uh, on the lead under leadership of France and the UK. Uh, but participants in that coalition decided that NATO should take over because NATO has a standing command structure a, a council to provide political transparency and oversight, and partners who joined the operation also wanted NATO to take uh, responsibility because they are partners of NATO, they know our structures. Uh, so this is the reason why NATO took responsibility for that operation. Okay, um, I promised the gentleman here, but I don't know where the microphone's gone, but the, the, the gentleman, yeah. If we pass that along to him. Uh, we're almost out of time, so make it quick, and then we'll try and get one more in. Um, hello, I'm Patrick from Germany. Thanks for this uh, engaging discussion. So in light of time, I'll ask a short question. Um, so Peter T. likes to ask this question in, re in relation to startups, but I think it also applies sort of to geopolitics. Um, what's an important truth you believe in that very few people agree with you on in regards to security? An important truth that you believe in that very few others would agree with you on in the context of global security. Is there some truth you hold dear that actually is sort of counterintuitive or that most people wouldn't share? I don't know if they <laughs> won't share it, uh, but um, uh, there is one fundamental which I think 
is really at the core uh, of uh, upholding peace and stability uh, in, in the world. And that is, appeasement doesn't lead to peace. If we who are living in free societies are not ready to step up to the plate and protect and promote freedom, liberal democracy, rule of law, respect for human rights, then the world will be ruled by brutal dictators, tyrants, and terrorists. That's the basic but we obviously I believe in. Right, but, but I hope <laughs> many people share it. I mean, it, 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 it's a really important concept, but if I were a Tibetan today, listening to that, and then watching European and other world leaders cozy up to the Chinese leadership because they want all of the goodies that economic relations bring, I might be a little bit cynical. But that's a... <laughs> and <clears throat> I, I regret that we have to <laughs> conclude now because... <laughs> I, 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 I actually, I think, and that may be a an, 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 uh, surprising point for some of you, I basically, I do believe that China is and will remain a positive story. I strongly believe in a peaceful rise of China in a constructive and positive cooperation with the United States. So, right, and because you believe that as a big idea, you're prepared to tolerate their abuse uh, of human rights and repression no. in a particular territory no, no, like of, Tibet. Of, of, of course not, of course not. But I do believe that engagement uh, with China is the best way to promote uh, the principles of freedom, democracy, human rights, rule of law. Right, okay, last one then. And we haven't been over here, and you've been very patient, so I'm gonna have to choose one of the two of you. Uh, Stephen, I have the mic. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you, you might, guys, you're just uh, you're ahead of me. Go on, you've got... Quick question. Uh, it's uh, for Mr. Rasmussen. Thank you very much for the frankness and the ambiguity. Uh, <laughs> my name is Akash, I come from India, so heavily interested in European geopolitics. Uh, I was wondering, and I say this with all due respect, the relevance of NATO sometimes seems to be questionable, not because of its credibility, because, but because there seems to be a divergence between interests, let's say, in the EU and member states in the EU who are not covered by NATO insurance. And I was wondering, uh, within the next 10 years, do you see NATO perhaps being displaced or even replaced by a more EU-centric armed forces, or an EU army, if you will? Mm -hmm. Thank you. The brief answer is no. Uh, and the reason is that many, many European nations <coughs> want NATO to remain the cornerstone of their security, <coughs> among other uh, reasons, uh, because of the strong link uh, with the United States. And they still consider uh, a US engagement in European security as a cornerstone uh, of uh, European uh, security. On the first part of it, I hope I have been very clear in my answers. There's only one point where I will remain, <coughs> where I will keep ambiguity, and that is how we will respond if we are attacked. Right. Well, uh, which, thank you for that wonderful cue. First of all, apologies over there. I promised you a question. You two were looking so excited, but unfortunately, Lunch is a huge priority <laughs> at St. Gallen, and, and I, I can't jeopardize our lunch. So I, I'm really sorry, but we're out of time for questions. It's my fault, not your fault. Um, but uh, Anders brought us back to what he said about Article 5 and about the absolute guarantee that there would be a military response uh, to an attack on a NATO member state. So let's just look at the final result. Do you expect NATO to retaliate if one of its members gets attacked? It's a glass half full or glass half empty result, Anders. You should be proud that 70% totally bought your commitment, but you should be a little bit worried that 30%, despite everything you said, still don't believe you. Um, but real life would prove me right. Yeah, well, let's hope we never find that out, eh? But um, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for lunch, but please give a very, very warm hand to Anders Thorasson. Thank you. Thanks, Anders. <laughs>